Baruch HaMabayim. Thank you very much for coming. This is, uh, again, we find ourselves in a, another interesting time, uh, Hanukkah. So our lecture tonight, and my thoughts, is on Hanukkah 2020. What a year. <laughs> First Pesach, Passover, then Shavuos, the High Holidays, and then Sukkot. The dates of the holidays are the same, but the celebrations are anything but the same. This year has been a year to remember. It seems as if nothing, absolutely nothing is normal. Everything seems to be just a little bit different. <laughs> different, that's an interesting word. Different does not have to be bad. Many times different means something new, something better. In addition, different can help us to realize just how good things were before, the good old days. Many times we don't realize what we had until we lose it. You know, I've been blessed to become what we call the American dream. I grew up as a kid on welfare to a single mother under the age of 18 with three kids, a Holocaust survivor. I got a job when I was 15 working in a delicatessen. 10 years later, I was the owner. Customers tell me about the good old days when the sandwiches were bigger. Well, the reality is that today, my standard sandwich is twice the size that it used to be in the good old days. However, in people's minds, everything in the past was better. Many times we live with perception, not reality. The truth is that my deli operation is much better today and always than it was years ago. I've taken all my experiences and tried to use them to allow me to be more efficient, to learn and grow on all levels. So the question becomes, can a worldwide pandemic help us to celebrate our holidays with more joy, more spirituality than we did before? Or are we so locked into the past that we can't find newer and maybe even better ways to share the experience of our lives and our relationship with our religion and our God? Life is all about growth. You know, Hanukkah is called the holiday of lights. Joy is connected with lights, as we say in our Havdalah prayer, as we escort the Shabbos queen out and welcome a new week in. We say, La Yehudim Hoysa Orovasimcha. To the Jews, there was light and joy. So we see that light precedes joy. The Shabbat, Shabbat candles are referred to as Shalom Bayis, peace in the house. After all, it's hard to see joy when you are in the dark. The first thing that God created in the creation of the world was light, or. Interestingly enough, the 25th word in the Torah, in creation, is the word or, light. And the word Chanukah translates to mean Chanu Chavhe, that they rested on the 25th, <clears throat> that, that we celebrate Chanukah on the 25th of Kislev. On the holiday of Chanukah, we light eight lights. The number eight, connects to the world of the spiritual, something that is above this world, much like the ritual of circumcision that is done on the eighth day after a baby boy is born. The Hebrew word for eight is shmona, which connects to the Hebrew word for soul, neshama, which is also connects to the word for oil, shem. But what does oil have to do with our souls? It stays in Mishle, in Proverbs twenty twenty seven, Ner Hashem, Nishma Sodom. The light of God is the soul of man. The soul of man is a, is a lamp of God within the body. This is analogous to a supernal life within the world. It was, it was put there to eliminate and enlighten as it searches all the innermost parts of man and monitors his thoughts. We see that when King Solomon, Shlomo Melech, built the first temple, which can be referred to as the soul of the world. He constructed the windows so that they would be narrow at the, in, at the inside and wide at the outside. This is contrary to how one would install a window in a house. One would want the larger opening on the inside so as to spread the light throughout the room. So King Solomon's intent was not to light the temple. God does not need light. His intent was for the light of God shining out from the temple to kindle and illuminate the spiritual fire that exists in the world. 
I find it very interesting that the world that we live in today has many similarities to the times of the Greek Empire and the story of Hanukkah. Alexander the Great was a world conqueror. He had lifted Greece to the pinnacle of world power. While he was alive, he showed reverence to the sages of Israel. You know, there's a famous story told <clears throat> that the Samaritans tried to convince Alexander the Great that he should destroy Jerusalem and that the Jews were a despicable nation. So Alexander, with his army, marched on Jerusalem. And at that time, Shimon Atzadik, Shimon the Righteous One, the last of the men of the Great Assembly, was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. He heard <clears throat> that Alexander and his army were marching on the city. So he went out to greet him, dressed in the holy garments of the high priest, and he met Alexander on the road, leading to the city. He hoped that he would be able to avert a war and the destruction of the holy city when the two parties met. When they did, Alexander the Great <clears throat> got off his horse and bowed on the ground before Shimon Atzadik. Everyone, <laughs> everyone was stunned. Alexander the Great bowed down before no man, let alone a Jew. He then explained to all that were in attendance that on every night before a battle, he would have a vision and in that vision, a man would appear to him and assure him of victory. The person in his dreams was the man standing in front of him. Shimon Atzadik, dressed in the clothing of the high priest. As long as Alexander lived, <clears throat> he treated the Jewish nation with kindness and respect, even friendship. As a sign of gratitude for saving Jerusalem and the nation, Shimon Atzadik told Alexander that all male babies born that year would be named Alexander. And this is why even today, Alexander is still used as a Hebrew name. He was so pleased that he suspended all taxes on the nation for a year. Sadly for the Jews, Alexander died a young man at the age of 33. <clears throat> None of his generals were able to rule his empire alone. And so three generals divided the empire between themselves. One ruled from Greece, one from Syria, and the third from Egypt. Now, when looking at the subjugation under the Greeks, one has to realize that the Greeks were not interested in subjugating their bodies. They only wanted to enslave the Jews' spirituality. They had great respect for the sages and the wisdom of the Torah. In fact, King Ptolemy, the Egyptian segment of Alexander's empire, who made his capital a center of learning and science, commissioned 72 sages to translate the Torah into Greek. His intent was so that the Greek scholars would be able to study its wisdom. And this is why another name for the Torah is Septuagint, which is the Greek word means 70. The Greeks felt that they were benefiting the Jews by imposing Greek culture and wisdom on them. They felt they were liberating the Jews from their ancient superstitions and backwardness. Other nations that the Greeks had conquered <clears throat> were more than willing to accept Greek culture they saw great light and wisdom in it. The Greeks were revolutionizing the world. When the Greeks entered the sanctuary, the holy temple, they defiled all the oils. That is to say that they blemished the thoughts and feelings of the majority of the Jewish people. These Jews were referred to as Hellenist. They saw the modern lifestyle of the Greeks as much freer and more entertaining. The Greeks came with their emphasis on physical beauty and prowess the Colosseums and the Olympic Games. They sought wisdom with philosophers such as Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. But in the end, all that they worshipped was man. They put their man in, their faith in man's aesthetic sense and his ultimate human reason. As an aside, Aristotle was a teacher of Alexander the Great. I came across a letter that supposedly was written by Aristotle on his deathbed to Alexander. In the letter, he extols the wisdom of the Jews and the Torah. He calls it the only truth. He tells Alexander that he would have told him this much earlier, but he was afraid that this admission might cost him his life. But now that he was on his deathbed, he felt compelled to leave Alexander with this truth. So a majority of the Jews were attracted to the wisdom of the Greeks and began to believe that their wisdom contained enduring reality. 
However, after the Maccabean revolt, when the Hashmonoims returned to the sanctuary victoriously, they found only one jar of pure oil. This amount of oil was sufficient to light the menorah for only one day. Symbolically, this is saying to us that despite all that the Greeks had done to taint the thoughts of the holy people of Israel, there still remained a small ray of holiness in their hearts, what we call the Pintaleid, a minimal spark of divinity, a lone spark of purity of thought and true wisdom. Some of the people still retained the knowledge that they were sacred, special, and chosen. God had chosen them to be a light unto the nations, so that the nations would one day walk by Israel's light and not the opposite. There are different opinions as to what we actually are celebrating on Hanukkah. And the blessing we say in our prayer is the Allah Nisim, is Allah Nisim for all the miracles. We commemorate the military victories. <clears throat> we light the menorah to commemorate the miracle of the oil that lasted for eight days. But I think there was even a greater miracle that occurred. Somehow, a small group of zealots who were incensed as they were forced to watch the Greek pagans sacrifice a pig on the altar in the Holy Temple revolted against Greece. The revolt was not logical. Greece was a world, the world power at the time. The small Jewish nation was no competition on any level. They reacted with their hearts and not their brains. It was a revolt that was doomed for failure from the outset. <laughs> but it didn't fail. In fact, the little Jewish nation actually won. But their victory was not based on military strength. It was based on their faith in God. Somehow, the Hashminoim were able to ignite that pintalia, that spark of divinity that burns within the heart of each and every Jew, whether they realize it or not and turned it into a raging fire. That fire reached up to the heavens so that now God, their father, would fight their battles. And then, as we recite in the al the mighty were delivered into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, and the wicked into the hands of the righteous. They were not alone. A Jew needs to know, needs to know that he is never alone. There is a Father in heaven that is always with him and loves him dearly. It is not based on merit. When we look around the world today, it seems that history is repeating itself. Instead of the Greek philosophy, we have democracy. We see democracy as a cure-all. But not everyone agrees. Freedom to choose is something that we may all want. But many times our choices are incorrect. Much of the free world has embraced democracy and has prospered under it. There are those, like the zealots, who practice Islam in the Middle East, who have fought the spread of democracy, even with their lives. They don't see it as a cure-all. In fact, just the opposite. They see the Western world as hedonistic, in total opposition to God and moral and religious values. You know, not everyone wants Western culture to take over their lives with this permissiveness and morally open society. Things like abortion, same-sex marriage, birth control, nudity, pornography, on and on, are all ideals that go against religious values. Morality is a key for a society to be able to survive and even flourish. Most of the great civilizations in history crumbled from the inside because of a breakdown of moral values. Herpes was so prevalent in the final days of the Roman Empire that they outlawed, outlawed kissing. Aristotle promoted pedophilia in his writings. Socrates was seen leaving a brothel. When asked, you Socrates? He answered, uh, this is Socrates the man. At other times, I am Socrates the philosopher. Who you are remains constant. One doesn't change his personality like one changes clothing. Today, it seems, the whole world is in a downward spiral. The word I seems to be the order of the day. Interesting, the word I is the only letter that is capitalized in the middle of a sentence. 
things need to change. Instead of I, we need to use the word we. We need to think of other people. We need to be givers, not takers. Even though things may look bleak at times, we need to look into our past. We need to believe that we have the power <clears throat> to change the world, to make things better. Now, even though it seems impossible that the world, especially world Jewry, should somehow be able to ignite the Pintaliyid once again, we need to remember that at the time of Hanukkah, it seemed impossible to overcome the Greeks and their philosophy. But we see that is exactly what happened. There was an awakening, awakening of godliness in the world. Things changed. They got better. There is always hope as long as we are connected to the source, God Almighty. There is an important lesson for us to learn from the holiday of Hanukkah. With the exception of Rosh Hashanah, all Jewish holidays fall out in the beginning or middle of the month, when the moon is bright. The longest that a holiday lasts is seven days. This is true through both Passover, Pesach, and Sukkot. They somehow exist within the natural order, seven days. Hanukkah lasts for eight days, an allusion to something above this world, supernatural. God is telling us that even in the darkest of times, physically or spiritually, <clears throat> he is always with us. All that he asks is that we make an effort, light the menorah, that spark of divinity that resides in our hearts. Then he will do his part and miraculously keep the flame burning for eight days, eternity. So in this time of great darkness, we need to know that within each one of us burns a small candle, a spark of divinity. And though it may only be a small flame, that light can eat up a lot of darkness. We have the ability and the responsibility to light other candles with our flame. Doing so will not diminish our light at all. Together with all the other small lights, we can create a bonfire of warmth and enthusiasm, binding us all into one unified nation that will destroy all the evil in the world. So let us look into the past and know that there is a loving Father who yearns to bestow upon us a wonderful future. Let us spin our dreidel with the letters Shin, Hey, Nun, Gimel. Altogether, they have a gematria of 358, the gematria of the word Mashiach, the Messiah. And with that, let us usher in the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time. Again, a happy Hanukkah to everyone. God bless you all. And again, next year, let's celebrate this in Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh with Mashiach Tzikainu. Keep smiling, stay happy, stay safe. Stay happy, stay well. God bless and have a Shabbat Shalom.